Okay, good morning everyone um, and welcome to the second webinar in this in our post 2020 series. Uh, we are very excited to have you join us this morning um, and today we're going to be looking at uh, ICLEI's submission to the SCBD Global Biodiversity Framework discussion document um, and the reflections there on in light of the uh, SCBD regional consultations that are in the process uh, and that are being undertaken. So uh, perhaps before we start, I can just say that the webinar is going to be recorded and the recordings will be made available uh, on the ICLEI YouTube channel as well as the Cities with Nature YouTube channel and will be sent to all participants who've registered. Uh, the aim of today is to start or spark a discussion. Um, so what we are proposing is that we will run through the presentations and then provide a, a time and space for uh, questions and discussion thereafter. So there will be two ways in which you can ask a question. The first is by raising your hand uh, and the second one is by entering in the chat box uh, to your right. Um, but we please ask that we uh, go through the presentation and then we open the floor to questions. Um, so a very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Um, and the very first uh, presentation uh, was created by Mr. Oliver Hello from this SCBD. Um, and it provides a broad overview of the consultations toward the post-2020 biodiversity framework uh, and the real issues of relevance for local and subnational governments. Uh, in his absence this morning, this presentation will be run or presented by Kobe Brandt, who's the Regional Director of ICLEI Africa, uh, as well as the City's Biodiversity Centre. So without further ado, I will hand over to Kobe. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, a warm welcome to everybody. We know it's an early morning um, for many of us, but uh, for some of us it's also quite late in the day already, so thank you very much for um, joining us wherever uh, you are in the world. Um, so we're going to go through the presentation quite quickly, as Tim, Tim said, and um, uh, firstly, let me just say thank you very much to Mr. Oliver Hill for um, supporting the process so much from the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And it's very important for us to note that we are, um, ICLE has been asked to really approach and tasked um, with um, um, willingly, shall I say, tasked with collecting the voice of um, all levels of subnational governments, feeding into different um, key milestones in the discussions um, towards a post-2020 biodiversity framework uh, by the CBD and this was decided in Egypt at the last COP um, which um, you see the, the logo of there up on your screen. Um, so um, in terms of uh, the process to date is that we, we're doing this very much as an open consultative process trying to be as inclusive as possible and allowing voices from as many organizations and individuals even in the subnational and local government space and those who work with us. So parties, um, uh, international organizations, science, um, the, the entire community, our entire community of practice is very welcome to participate and enrich our discussions over the months ahead and also so when we come to key points um, where we will be presenting zero drafts and um, uh, be informed also by other processes. So thank you for the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity for affording um, this opportunity for our se uh, sector. And um, we are looking forward to doing this very much in partnership with many other organizations these regular webinars will be one of the ways in which we um, get input from everybody. So um, Oliver has put down a slide just to say that it is still early days. Um, it is um, quite clear that the, um, I'm just going to take that away for us. It is quite clear that um, it is um, 
at this stage, people are talking about the vision of for 2050, and that, that vision, we must not lose track of that vision, which is around living in harmony with nature. In other words, living within planetary boundaries and thriving in within living within those boundaries as well. Um, so um, at the top of his slides, he's talking about the um, consultations that have taken place from the CBD side. The CBD is running um, a number of regional consultations. There's been the Asia and Pacific consultation, the um, uh, European consultation, um, Africa, and there'll also be um, others. Um, he's mentioning that this month, there'll be the Latin American Caribbean consultation taking place in May, and Italy will be represented there. I know that Italy was able to be represented by um, Mr. Holger Rohrbrecht, who is on this call with us um, at the West uh, European consultations. And in a little while, I will ask Mr. Rohrbrecht if he's willing and able to just give us a few insights into what he experienced attending that on, on our collective behalf. And then there are going to be two sets of contributions um, at uh, plus the GBO5. And the first very key meeting that we must all note is the open-ended working group meeting on the, at the end of August in Nairobi. We will be there. And it's at that moment, ahead of that moment actually, that we will have to have what we call a zero draft or a first draft um, of our collective position statement. Um, so after this consultation, um, we will be um, uh, starting to work on this draft. And I think it was very timely last week that all these wonderful documents came out, the one after the other, three very significant documents, um, which can certainly also raise the ambition globally, raise the urgency of the issues globally, and give us a clear indication of where global science is telling us to go, and also where global commitments are going. It looks very ambitious and it certainly has inspired us greatly to be rather bold and to think rather um, innovatively in, uh, towards uh, formulating the subnational um, decisions. So um, early, early days, but um, it's clear that the SCBD, the, the, the collective of parties of the convention, um, are clear that they want to align with other processes, specifically they mention the climate process a lot, but also the Sendai, also be informed by the IPBS outcomes, etc., and very much the SDGs as well. And they're talking about smart engagement. In other words, they're talking about uh, measurable and verifiable indicators, etc. And that's coming out quite strongly. Um, they want to see really pledges and reviews and a ratchet mechanism in place for five-year milestones. And um, but they're also keeping open to hear what others are saying and things that are coming out is about no net loss to, of biodiversity, et cetera. And we see that the IPB7 report indicated now a loss of up to a million species in the decades ahead. So that's not a mean, um, um, uh, uh, that's not going to be an easy task at all to achieve. And then they're mainstreaming. Of course, you know, the last two COPs have all been about mainstreaming into different sectors. This mainstreaming approach will continue as um, we move along. Um, so I think um, it is um, very clear that mainstreaming into the sectors will form part of their parcel and thinking. Um, that gives us ideas, but of course that doesn't mean that we have to have the same approach, but it's good to understand where the Secretariat's thinking is at the moment. Um, in terms of subnational governments, I must say they've been very supportive and they're also pointing out here, as we do, that the plan of action on subnational governments, cities and other local authorities for biodiversity, we are still in that decade. It's 2011 to 2020. That was adopted in Aichi and Nagoya by the parties. And the party, parties there 
um, encouraged uh, really and recognized really for the first time at that scale, the role of subnational governments at all levels in um, achieving the NBSAP goals or in supporting the achievement of the NBSAP goals and that we have to and we can and we are developing our own tools, strategies, action plans, etc. in support of these NBSAPs. Um, so more actional ele elements came through in later years. Specifically, I want to point you to the Quintana Roo and the Sharm El Sheikh communiques that came out in the last four years, three years. And um, these are both statements that were made by our constituency, calling on parties to do certain things, but also committing and undertaking to collectively work with one another and our sectors in doing um, a number of um, um, things from our side. So we want to build on those early commitments and um, we want to strengthen those. And one of the most important commitments I think that came out of that was actually a collective call to the parties to just implement all the decisions that they have made subsequently in the consecutive COPs. Um, um, since early days, since um, Bonn, when, when they first started talking about the role of local governments. Um, and if, the, if parties can collectively do that already, that will go a very, very long way. So um, it's cross-dimensional, it, it, uh, it looks at all the different sectors, etc., as we said, and um, the CBD wants to see us coming forward with ideas and statements of what they should be adopting for the post-2020 ambition in all those different sectors. Multi-level governance and cooperative structures, vertical and horizontal mainstreaming, um, and the city-region um, approach is also very, very uh, important and coming through, and we agree with that. So I've, I've spoken about our growing partnership. It includes also the goals and the European Committee of Regions and many other role players are part and parcel of this process. Um, there will also be a focus um, as the CBD is indicating here on using the new cities uh, with nature and in brackets the CBD has uh, licensed themselves to put in their cities and regions with nature of course uh, we are talking uh, when we talk about cities with nature we are talking about an inclusive approach which is open also to all all levels of subnational government who are all welcome to be active and part of that collective platform but that platform is essentially cities with nature will be the platform through which we will drive and develop the post-2020 framework. And then the evidence is clear. Um, um, we've all seen the reports last week. Um, I think it's also important just to remind ourselves that some scientists here from within ICLEI um, and scientists from elsewhere in the world came together um, and brought out last year um, at the COP, um, the NUCA report or Nature in the Urban Century report, which addressed research opportunities and gaps and was a good um, foundation on which scientifically on which we were able to build. And that was, of course, before the IPB7 came out, but the IPB7 really just strengthened what was said there already. We know the importance of the urban areas, and we know that uh, the habitat loss that is taking place in the urban areas is um, very, very serious, and we can do a lot within our cities to achieve that. So, Oliver Hillel, I hope I did try to do some justice to your slides. Thank you very much for sending them through to us um, and Oliver may join us for the later call today although he is in meetings on cities with by in in nature uh, with colleagues of ours in Washington with a, a, a meeting with the World Bank today so he'll try and join us so I'm quickly going to go through our slides not going to focus too much on who we are because you already know this um, and you already know that we have been active collectively in this space since very early 
days. Um, it's been more than 12 years now that we've been working very closely um, with the CBD COP processes, feeding our voices into these decisions. And um, consecutively, we've seen stronger and stronger decisions coming through from the COPs um, in terms of um, the, uh, the role um, um, that um, cities and all levels of subnational governments play and should be playing. So, but we've recently upscaled, we've recently intensified our advocacy work um, ahead of COP15, and this is very important because COP15, of course, is going to be the Paris moment for biodiversity. And we already see um, the evidence and the science backing that sort of very strong post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, and it is very important that we, together with our partners, are looking to a formal position that can feed into timelessly into the processes ahead of that formulation of the post-2020 framework. And let me just point out that we're not aiming to have a position paper at that COP. It will be long before that COP. Already in this open-ended working group in Nairobi in August, we will have the draft um, outline because that is the moment where we need to make sure where our message lands. And then our message will be refined and further shaped but it will already be there that we need to, this year already, that we need to have a collective statement. Um, so um, just to say that the Nagoya Action Plan was really groundbreaking and it really gives us a very good base on which to work. That decision 1022 will go down in history as the moment when first uh, and collectively um, uh, the, the CBD parties decided to include and recognize local and subnational governments, not as other actors or as NGOs or as um, stakeholders, but as governments in their own right, um, with own decision-making authority, and who need to play a very active role alongside national governments in the implementation of any global deal that is made. And it is here on the ground where mainstreaming integration, as we know, is most essential, and where such mainstreaming is a daily prerequisite for good governance and sustainable development. And the mayors and the cities on this call obviously will understand that they have to deal with these decisions on a daily basis and they make the land use decisions between subnational and local governments depending on the country and the legislation that's applicable in any one country. It's at that subnational level that, level that um, land use management decisions are made. I'm going to skip through the Nagoya Action Plan, more uh, uh, information about that, because I want to get to um, more of a discussion between us about what we want to see in this first um, uh, document that we are preparing now for the open-ended working group. Um, we will be advocating for a stronger recognition of the mandates and competencies of local and subnational governments. Specifically, uh, if we look at um, continents like Africa and in many parts of the global south, the mandates and the competencies are not yet clear and there are still blurred lines in terms of where the mandates lie. And many of these mandates are still quite centralized. And we believe that um, it is good to advocate for a decentralization of these mandates, along with the needed finances and capacities to actually implement these mandates um, and to truly work towards a multi level way of cooperation and governance between the different levels of government. And that is the only way that we can address nature-based solutions, make them as most effective as possible. And in fact, we are saying the same thing in the climate space as well. So in the same way that we need all actors taking hands in the climate space, the same level and the same urgency 
is needed and the same partnering approach is needed when it comes to addressing nature's issues that we're facing today. Um, so this is one of the key milestones, key messages that we want to land because although many parts of the world already have quite clarified mandates for local and subnational governments, it's not the case in all instances. And then the second issue that we want to highlight is, of course, the ecosystem approach. And that means that we do not only look at the territory and the cadastral boundaries of any one particular local government. Very often, and in most cases, in fact, um, local governments, the cadastral boundaries actually mean nothing in terms of where the ecosystem services and resources come from that serve that particular local government. If I look, for instance, at my city, Cape Town, a lot of the resources, water, um, clean air, all those aspects, um, the rich biodiversity, food, etc. It comes from our surrounding communities, surrounding the city. And this is the case in many big cities. Um, Mexico City, its watershed is outside of the city, etc. We know all these examples. So we need to work on a landscape based and ecosystem approach and strengthen our urban rural linkages. It's no use that we build very strong, powerful cities. Um, uh, if they do not have the resources and the ecosystems that are uh, that are strong and have the integrity to keep on supporting our growing urban populations. And it works both ways because cities, um, again, offer huge markets, it offer huge opportunities, etc., for these um, more rural communities to um, specifically in, in, in food, for instance, um, to um, um, bolster biodiversity friendly and eco-friendly approaches when it comes for instance to farming practices etc um, so small scale job creation and that sort of thing in the surrounding communities um, is also vital um, for our bigger cities that for us is absolutely a principle we agree with FAO's approach and take on that um, another message that we want to get through um, and all these messages have been maturing over the last years. We want to put them there very concretely and then build on them further, is to um, ensure that the past decisions are actually implemented. Um, and I've spoken to that already. Um, and one of these um, um, uh, uh, duties of implementation, of course, rests on our own shoulders. We need to take the opportunities presented by the CBD COP decisions about their recognition of local and subnational governments and turn that into concrete actions, programs, opportunities, platforms, etc. And here I want to point to the Cities with Nature platform specifically, which is a very, very large big tent platform open to any city of any size and shape and all our partners to come together to learn from each other inspire each other and to commit to certain targets and to actually then also report on the uh, uh, progress along such targets and that's very much in line with the 2020 vision and what we see what the IPB7 is calling for at the moment, and also the leader's document, which was signed um, 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 also last week, um, uh, the uh, document which, which a group of um, the, the G77, but with a group of other uh, political leaders also signed the next document. That was called very much for um, this sort of approach. So um, if we move forward, um, how can local and subnational governments be more effective um, in this vertical um, alignment? Again, looking inward, what can we do as a sector? Um, and I, I want to point you to a very important document, which is a guideline document that we've um, 
collectively um, worked on and many of you have actually made inputs there are many examples of cities and subnational governments around the world of how we can um, contribute to the NBSAP approach the national biodiversity strategy and action plan approach up until now and up until 2020 the NBSAP is the way in which any one of the parties actually report their ambitions and their progress towards the IG targets. And we know the IG targets were also um, uh, um, formulated and adopted in Nagoya <coughs> up till 2020. And well, half of the IG targets um, do not have the 2020 deadline, but um, I think just more than half of them actually do end in 2020. So the world will be looking at what comes after the IG targets for sure. And if the NBSAP approach is still the right approach. But what we are saying here, and clear early indications are that uh, an approach like the NBSAP approach will definitely be part of a post-2020 agreement. Um, what we are saying here in these guidelines is that both parties, both the national governments and the subnational governments can come a lot closer in terms of um, formulating these NBSAPs, sitting around a table deciding collectively what the nation's ambitions can be, in incorporating the contributions that the local governments can make. And here um, we will be building on that vertical integration very much. So there was the um, paper, the discussion paper um, that was brought out by the CBD and the deadline for making comments into that post-2020 global framework uh, discussion paper was the 15th of April and we made a couple of comments and those documenta that documentation will be made available to everybody participating in this uh, webinar and we'll also send you the icky comments that um, we made in that paper. So specific issues that we just wanted to raise um, was that we really need transform transformative change um, or transformational change, if you wish, and that it is important that uh, to do that in a multi-level approach. Um, and we also want to make the point we, uh, we don't only live in, want to live in harmony with nature by 2050. We need to know that we are living in the urban century. And that century is reshaping the world very rapidly. Um, urbanization is unstoppable. And we need to really look at how cities are going to grow, how cities are going to use resources. And there, within that space, um, the, a lot of achievements can be achieved if we work together um, with the parties of the CBD um, to actually restore and bring back nature into the plans of uh, expansion of cities and into the rebuild and reshape um, of cities as they are um, developing and progressing. So um, cities with nature, I've spoken about that already. For us, that is a very, very good platform through which everybody can come together and show and demonstrate what they are doing, whether they are focusing more on invasive species or on water management or on different aspects of um, social dimensions and uh, health and well-being of communities. Um, Cities with Nature will be able to demonstrate and showcase all the initiatives that are out there, but it will allow cities also to enter through pathways, um, and learn from each other, share, commit and report on what they are doing in the space of connecting with nature planning with nature, nurturing nature, and working with nature. So um, we support the position, of course, that is in that document about involving local and subnational governments directly in national target setting, as I said. And many of these can actually be significantly advanced if we work together with all these levels of government. Um, I'm coming to an end. I just want to say that there's also strong support from within our sector that we've been picking up and reporting on 
to forge stronger and more explicit alignment and synergies between um, what we are doing at all levels of um, sustainable development. Um, so we are already looking at systemic approaches in cities, linking biodiversity, climate change, um, urbanization, circular economy, uh, all those aspects together in terms of integrated solutions for cities. So we're very delighted to see that um, the CBD is also promoting such an integration approach between the different, the SDGs and the Sendai and these different other approaches. Um, so uh, in terms of the relationship between the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and other relevant processes, we just wanted to mention that um, uh, there is increasing recognition, but the inc inclusion of nature-based solutions um, in the climate summit specifically that is taking place this year and of course then also in the upcoming climate COP later this year um, is of specific importance. Um, for us climate and biodiversity and, uh, are sitting at the same level, they are not the same and they should, the one should not fall under the other, they are two parallel processes that need to have been, uh, develop and strengthen each other. Uh, any progress on climate change, if done with in consideration of nature, will greatly enhance our targets and our achievements on the biodiversity side and vice versa. But we should not merge these two agenda, agendas completely. Um, uh, however, we do welcome very much the um, CBD approach for, for working much closer within the climate field, as these are very much aligned. And then mainstreaming, we've spoken about the need for mainstreaming and really cities and our city networks and our actors have, have stepped forward. We have many good examples of um, approaches. I know in the European context, there are Horizon 2020 projects that are doing fantastic work. Um, and our ICLE office in Europe is involved in a number of those. Our partners, IUCN and others, are in, involved in, in, in numerous others as well. Here in Africa, we, for instance, have a fantastic program called Urban Natural Assets. Uh, you'll see it in the corner there. It's called Una Rivers for Life. It's got a rivers focus, it's got a coastal focus, it's got a social focus, etc. And it runs in quite a few sub Saharan African countries. We've got a Global South Interact Bio project, which is funded by the German BMU through the ICI process, which works in three continents already. In, uh, it's in um, South Asia in Africa and in South America. And we're looking towards um, really expanding that initiative in many more um, countries in that region, but also in other regions. And we have a, a legacy, a very proud legacy of our local action for biodiversity program, which brought about 50 cities um, together from around the world, big and small cities, who all work collectively in a progress sort of process um, uh, towards a mainstreaming um, biodiversity. And it is through that lab process where we first coined the phrase of LBSAPs, Local Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans, um, to complement the NBSAPs. Um, and that work will continue. Um, so in terms of um, uh, in terms of integrating diverse perspectives, this is really um, we, uh, we feel we, it's good that we are mentioned there, and this is almost the only place where local and subnational governments are mentioned in the discussion document, but we're making the point that um, we, actually local and subnational governments should be mentioned in many more aspects of that working document, and it should be mainstreamed throughout the document, throughout the entire framework agreement. The role of local and subnational governments should be clear, loud and clear, and ambitious, um, and that will only benefit any global deal that is made and celebrated in China in 2020. So thank you very much, Tim. That concludes my presentation. I'm handing over to you now to facilitate any discussion, um, and maybe you want to also invite one or two speakers to add um, a few points. Great.
<clears throat> Great, thank you for that, Kobe. Um, I hope everyone has enjoyed and benefited from the, uh, the presentation. Um, and at this point, uh, we would like to welcome any questions or points for discussion. But before we do that, perhaps we can call on Holger, if he is willing, to just give a, a brief sort of overview of his experience of the, uh, re the regional consultation he was able to attend in Europe. Um, and I will ask my colleague Julia and the World Secretariat to help me in uh, moderating this part of the discussion. Um, so Holger, if we can unmute your microphone and if you are willing to just give us a few points, that would be great. Sure, Timothy, with pleasure. Um, yeah, the, the uh, consultation was mentioned uh, by Kobe in her uh, presentation um, as, as one of, I think, four uh, that are being carried out uh, by the um, Secretariat for the Convention uh, in, in different reg regions of the world. The, the first one was in the beginning of this year uh, in the Asian region uh, taking place in Japan. Um, and the um, regional consultation process, I'd say, uh, is actually a very open process uh, organized by the Secretariat um, in order to really gain uh, from both the experiences uh, from uh, the last decade of uh, the biodiversity process, so the Aichi decade, if I may say so, um, and um, uh, then learn from that, uh, including also um, ideas uh, and um, perspectives uh, from a number of, of partners and parties um, for the global biodiversity framework. So it was both a, a review uh, pro, uh, um, element and also a perspective element in it. Um, the um, two chairs of this process, uh, Mr. Francis Ogwal um, uh, from uh, Uganda and uh, Mr. Basil Van Havre from uh, Canada, uh, have led um, the, the process um, uh, in a very open and participatory spirit, um, suggesting really that every voice counts and every idea counts. Um, they uh, were presenting themselves as listeners uh, most of all, and partners uh, to to the process, and they just wanted to present um, like uh, guidance uh, to uh, facilitate this this very open discussion process, which, uh, in my view, uh, worked very well. Um, the uh, two and a half days that we spent with more than 100 participants, mostly from parties, uh, so representing national governments from Europe, but also from Northern, uh, North America uh, and also from Oceania, um, uh, plus um, European Commission as a, a particular body uh, that we have in Europe. Um, and and um, uh, in addition to that, we also had a number of stakeholder groups groups um, from global environmental uh, um, uh, and conser nature conserv uh, uh, conservation organizations like WWF uh, or IUCN uh, and uh, then um, representatives of what is called the major groups um, including youth, um, women, uh, indigenous people and local communities, and then uh, local and subnational governments. Um, the last uh, group was represented by myself and um, Rachel Levesque uh, from uh, uh, from uh, Canada, uh, and representing here the Energy Forest D network, which is the regional network that is sort of uh, Eclay's pendant on the regional side, um, and uh, together as Kobe uh, alluded um, uh, upon, we uh, lead on the local and subnational government constituency. Mm -hmm. um, the um, basis uh, for the whole uh, consultation was the discussion paper that uh, Kobe addressed in her presentation, uh, which includes 17 chapters with 26 questions. Uh, and these 26 questions um, uh, refer to uh, basically all the aspects of um, the uh, future global biodiversity framework, um, but it also includes um, some questions that relates to like the process towards still, and 
then obviously the structure of the uh, uh, biodiversity framework, including its vision, its mission, its orientation, um, what should be like the, uh, the the vision by 2050, what should be a milestone uh, uh, and orientation by 2030. Uh, this was uh, one very important part of the discussion process. The second very important element was the um, uh, sort of themes uh, or structural elements to be included in the uh, global biodiversity framework. Kobe mentioned the uh, national biodiversity strategy and action plans, but then also uh, the uh, potentially to be used targets and indicators, um, the performance and monitoring, reporting verification me mechanism, um, mainstreaming aspects, um, how capacity development should be included in the GBF uh, um, post-2020 uh, and what resources uh, would be available and how it could be accessed. Uh, and um, there was also uh, a uh, quite interesting uh, debate uh, about the um, terminology and communication um, aspects of a future uh, framework. Uh, for example, uh, in how far we should uh, talk about nature uh, instead of biodiversity in the future framework to be more embedding uh, and um, give people uh, an immediate um, uh, um, also emotional um, um, adherence uh, to the message that would come out. Um, also ecosystem services that had, has been used in the past very widely uh, was discussed whether or not it should be um, uh, turned into the notion nature's contribution to people in the same sentiment uh, to potentially uh, bring people much closer to the uh, biodiversity agenda. Um, in um, the, the, the whole um, uh, process was actually organized in uh, stations uh, and all the participants uh, were basically uh, uh, walking from one topical station to another uh, and uh, presented uh, their input ideas and experiences. Um, I will not go into too many details here, uh, but um, uh, want to uh, just mention that uh, the, the, the um, like topical centers of these stations um, that included resource mobilization. So the question again, uh, what um, type of capa uh, capacities and finances can be used? Most of the discussion here was about what is called the voluntary commitments. Um, that was an agreement from the COP14 in Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, to supplement uh, the NBCEPs and identify additional commitments that parties can uh, put on the table uh, to support actually the implementation uh, of uh, and achievement towards the uh, Aichi targets and close the gap actually that we will see in, in 2020 uh, with their implementation. But uh, these commitments should uh, reach beyond uh, 2020 and have a longer lasting uh, effect. The second element was, as I mentioned, uh, communications uh, and um, um, the question how messages should be uh, brought forward, uh, in what way, I alluded uh, on, on that one. Um, then um, there was one uh, station that focused on the integration of diverse perspectives, and this is, I think, for local and subnational governments very, very important because in this uh, topical segment, uh, also the, the contributions of cities and regions in the biodiversity framework uh, was discussed next to the other major groups. Uh, and um, the question um, uh, appeared and it was actually carried throughout um, the, um, uh, the consultation in Western Europe, uh, if uh, cities and regions should not rather be seen uh, as a formal part of the governance structure for the post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework with the effect uh, that uh, um, this group would be uh, included structurally and systematically uh, in the process to develop and implement and in the, uh, evaluate the centerpiece of the future global biodiversity framework, which is to uh, and, and will remain uh, the NBSAPs. Um, the, there, there is obviously a discussion here um, also 
um, what makes the local and subnational governments distinctive vis-a-vis um, -vis the other major groups. Uh, in my view, um, the uh, point here is obvious, whereas we have community groups in three of them, uh, the local and subnational governments are a functional element and that uh, makes them distinctive and puts them rather in the basket uh, of, the, of the governance uh, framework. Um, the uh, next station was about the NBCEPs and many of the discussions that I just mentioned um, came back, uh, but also there was uh, talk um, about the um, uh, the NBCEPs themselves, which uh, don't have a proper guidance. Uh, there is no standard for the NBCEPs. Every country basically um, uh, develops their own uh, uh, structure uh, and also the the um, um, basically the contents and uh, some of the mechanism around it. Uh, this should be um, uh, taken forward and. A, a future uh, global biodiversity framework should present a more standardized uh, approach with a template potentially uh, and more uh, uh, opportunities to compare and yeah, um, find also guidance and inspiration in, in other NBCEPs uh, that are of the same kind. Um, there, there is uh, quite a number of discussion about uh, the mandatory and voluntary commitment, um, the, how they relate to each other, uh, what actually a voluntary commitment can mean and be in addition to what is inside the NBCEPs. And also much of the discussion is um, uh, around um, whether or not we should have locally determined contribution like we know from the uh, UNFCCC, the climate process, uh, in, uh, uh, in complementation uh, to the national contributions, which is the NBCEPs, and Kobe mentioned also uh, the LBCEPs, the local biodiversity and action plans, as a potential instrument for that. Uh, the final sta uh, station was on mainstreaming. Uh, I think this has been very much uh, um, elaborated by Kobe, and there is no additional point to make here from the consultation. Um, uh, uh, the the uh, big point uh, is uh, that mainstreaming will be a very, very important element in the uh, future global biodiversity framework. In addition to these six stations, um, the uh, consultation allowed for uh, a number of on-spot topics to be uh, taken uh, um, uh, forward in the discussion. And the most important was actually monitoring, reporting, and verification. Uh, and I confirm here what uh, Kobe said before, uh, that um, this element of accountability, monitoring, reporting, verification will become very, very strong in the future framework. A number of aspects to the discussion have been brought forward, both uh, very strong ideas that potentially can be implemented um, easily, but others um, that also uh, will need more consideration, perhaps even more scientific support, um, as uh, the um, um, monitoring and, and um, verification elements not easily compared to the UNFCCC. Here we have uh, the uh, uh, global target uh, to achieve uh, um, um, or to, to limit uh, global warming by 1.5 degrees, whereas in, in biodiversity we have numerous indicators potentially to, um, uh, to support uh, by a monitoring framework and monitoring is not easy, um, as, as we know from uh, the IPBES and um, previous works from scientists in regard of uh, um, uh, the identification of loss of biodiversity. Uh, so there, there is a number of methodological uh, um, aspects still to be clarified. Uh, but most importantly, there is a, a great um, uh, agreement in at least in this Western European consultation um, uh, about the ratchet uh, moments uh, so that uh, this ratchet mechanism, Kobe mentioned that in her presentation, uh, that we need to ensure whatever we do, uh, uh, that we walk forward uh, towards the global ambitions and targets and never fall back. Uh, and uh, I believe that the consultation has already uh, presented some very interesting uh, elements of that type of mecha mechanism in order to meaningfully implement it. Um, I think here I should stop. I have spoken already a little bit too long, I believe. Timothy, back to you. Thanks so much, Holger. It's some interesting insights coming out of there, and it seems like most of them are, you know, 
pretty much aligned with what ourselves and our constituency and our partners are uh, all advocating for. So thank you for that. Thanks for your inputs. Um, at this time, we just want to check if there's any other questions or points for discussion from anyone on the call. It doesn't look like there are any questions so far. All right, so if, if you don't mind, I have a question for Holger. Um, Holger, having attended the, um, the European consultation process and having seen the three very important documents that came out last week, um, uh, what do you think would have changed, if anything, in those discussions had these documents been released um, before your consultation? In other words, how did last week influence uh, the, the discourse in your mind and how should it influence the discourse in your mind for us? Well, that is a very interesting question, Kobe. Uh, thank you for that. I think um, we easily could spend um, an, a day or two uh, to speculate about uh, how the world would would change uh, if people use things at a certain point in time. Um, but um, let me put it that way. Um, there are a number of um, elements in uh, these documents uh, that could have been and were anticipated uh, by uh, many um, uh, participants to the consultation meeting. Um, uh, in that sense, um, uh, the um, uh, most of the discussion have uh, um, tried to to be um, implemented in in uh, the spirit uh, that we need to step up um, our ambition level. However, uh, I believe that uh, the drastic messages and clarity uh, that is now on the table, uh, with clear messages also to policymakers, uh, would still have changed um, the discussions in that way um, that the core aspect, the the, uh, the NBCEPs, the National Biodiversity Strate uh, and Strategies and Action Plans, would have seen differently. Um, in the consultations, many of the parties, many of the uh, uh, countries and, and, and um, national governments have actually um, referred to the fact that uh, the NBCEP development uh, was a very, very heavy exercise. Um, and um, in some in some cases, it took seven, eight years uh, actually from uh, the, the starting point uh, in, in 2010 uh, to elaborate um, the, the um, uh, the action plans um, and the implementation has not even started in in most of of the cases um, and many of the countries said okay we have achieved um, the establishment and publication and adoption uh, of the NBCEPs and we should continue using them in that same way. Uh, so I believe that um, many of these are quite heavy mechanisms uh, with um, a diversity of very scientifically based um, uh, ambitions and, and targets uh, included. Um, and also um, they have not obviously included um, the necessity of a very strong performance orientation and I believe that uh, exactly that would have been very much influenced uh, so the position uh, of parties of countries vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, the use uh, and uh, potentially progression of the uh, NBCEPs um, that had, had would have been, in my view, influenced towards uh, let's make a lighter version, let's make a more comparable version, um, uh, let's make uh, even a standard for the NBCEPs uh, that drives the performance forward and um, that also allows really uh, the integration uh, of all the relevant actors, including local and subnational government constituency. Thank you very much, Holger. And I just want to, for the record, um, also state to others on the call that the three documents I'm referring to are, of course, the IPBS 7th report that came out and um, which highlighted a number of, um, which it was the biggest effort of the IPBS community so far in terms of coming up with a collective statement on the state of nature in the world. 
and um, of course that was released um, with great anticipation by the community but as you say a lot of people were aware more or less of what was going to come out of there i think they did a very good job in really articulating the messages very well and it was very important for us to see that there is wide recognition and um, encouragement also for the role of cities and other levels of subnational government um, from the scientific community. The scientific community clearly sees that cities, our levels of government, will need to play a very, very strong role and our urban communities will need to play a very, very strong role in addressing the situation of, of the decline of nature in future. So that's very key for us and, and it really boosts and bolsters, I think, the um, ambitions we can have and the um, projects and programs and initiatives our cities should be embarking on. So we from ICLE will be calling throughout the month of May very strongly towards all levels of subnational governments, all cities around the world to join us, take hands in our global cities with nature ambition, where we are talking about MRV type of commitments, MRV type of actions, etc. So uh, the science community gave us a very strong um, confirmation of what we know the role of cities should be in the future. The second document that we that came out just the day thereafter is from the OECD, and that is a finance and economic business case for biodiversity action. So um, this was prepared by the OECD for the French presidency and the G7 environmental ministers meeting, which took place on the 5th and the 6th of May in France. The latter meeting took place, the environmental ministers meeting took place in Metz, which is in France. And um, which brings me to the third very important report, and that is the NEDS, um, uh, I think it's, it's commitment, I don't have the document in front of me, a charter or something like that, but it is very important that all the G7 um, countries, through their ministers of environment, as well as the EU, and a number of supporting countries, um, from the Global South, I remember Fiji and a number of others too from Africa also uh, put, uh, pledged their support to the MEDS commitment, which again also um, spoke very clearly about the need and the commitment from their side to work with all levels of subnational governments, including local and others, um, and also uh, giving us a strong commitment from these very important countries that they already recognize and they already are reaching out to their levels of subnational government um, to take action. So I think all three of these very important documents that came out, along with the letter of 400 influential people. Um, I think there were some film stars, etc., as well, but there were certainly also some very heavyweight scientists and other leaders that pledged their names behind the letter to the G7 governments and to other governments of the world in terms of nature. That letter is also an indication of um, a world basically recognizing um, that nature needs to be at least on par with climate when it comes to commitments and action and mobilization. So from, from, from what happened last week, we feel energized. We feel it's a sort of not that what we've been saying and doing is right and good, but it should be upscaled and it should be outscaled uh, in a very transformative and an urgent way. And in that regard, I also just want to inform uh, participants here that um, the World Bank is hosting a summit this very week and some of our colleagues are there 
on the role of cities and um, we are welcoming the World Bank to come on board some of the initiatives that and build on what we've been uh, building up over the last decade through the cities program. Joining cities with nature would be fantastic. Um, there's the IUCN Urban Alliance, which is really taking off and focusing on indicators, which is going to be so much needed in our space in future. So we wish everybody in the sector um, very well in all their endeavours. We hope to see many more examples and innovative practices and so on coming through um, as we're leading up to 2020. And specifically also, um, we will be working with our colleagues in um, China. Um, uh, we've got an office in Beijing um, and many partners there. Um, and the different um, 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 levels of government um, in China, where um, um, 2020 is actually going to culminate. Um, we are already in close contact with them um, to understand their ambition and their contribution, because that is also significant at the global scale. So thank you very much. I want to say we are energized. I hope our entire sector is energized with us and will join us in future webinars. And Tim, just to reiterate from our side as well, any comments, any inputs that anybody wants to make into the draft of this document um, that we will be preparing for the open-ended working group meeting in Nairobi in August are most welcome. Please send through your comments um, to Timothy, um, to anybody at the within ICLI, to Holger, uh, to any of our offices, it will reach us. You can send to me directly as well, um, use any of our, our means of communication and get your voices heard. Uh, we'd like to we'd like to share your ambition with, with the rest of the world. So thank you, Timothy. Right, thank you, Kobe. And uh, those three documents that Kobe has mentioned, uh, we will certainly send links to them in the follow-up emails for those who have registered and participated in the webinar. So I just want to take this opportunity as well to reiterate what Kobe's already said, to thank everybody for attending. Um, and we hope that you will join us in our next webinar um, as we continue on this exciting process. As Kobe said, we're very energized on our end. Um, and uh, we look forward to what is coming. So uh, thank you to everyone for attending and we will see you next time.